So the, the, next, uh, the next talk is from uh, Jean Passamani, uh, who has a long history of doing lots of stuff at <laughs> NHLDI, NHGRI, physician education, uh, and uh, is going to talk about physician education programs. Well, good morning. And for those of you who I haven't met, um, I spent two decades at NHLBI mostly designing and running clinical trials and trying to keep an extramural division together, um, a place where we could barely agree where to go to lunch together, much less anything else. So, um, Eric, I, I feel your pain. Um, the second two decades I spent in a community hospital as an executive a director of cardiology initially and as a chief medical officer later, so I know the enemy, which is uh, the practice community who are very, very different from Fruit Street in Boston or Monument Street in Baltimore. Uh, I've dealt with a thousand of them and um, they are a different bunch. Um, I think it's appropriate that I come at the end of this meeting. Uh, physician education is way, way down on um, Eric's uh, strategic plan. It's way, way to the right. Lots of things have to happen before that can be done very well. Although um, it seems like um, that's where we want to end up. That's where the rubber meets the road, where patients derive benefit from your, all your hard work. There are a couple of light, light motifs in this presentation I'm going to make, and my hope is that I can stimulate some discussion because we're going to have to grapple with this sooner or later, and sooner is better. One is that specialty, specialties march through that strategic plan at different tempos. Um, infectious disease is really into this business now, I'm told. In fact, I have it from an expert in infectious disease that infe infectious disease fellows no longer do gram stains. They do genomes of bacteria to identify the organism and then treat it appropriately. So the ID folks are really into this in a big way and um, f further along than I think most. Oncology seems like another one that's out in front as well. Um, so all doctors are not equal in terms of physician education. You've got to sort of temper your approach by where they are. Um, the other part of that is professional associations are really the way to get at practicing docs. And um, they have uh, an ability to do both general literacy, which I think is really important to kind of at least have the sense of what's going on in genomics, and also they carefully drive, draft guidelines, which Paul qu quite appropriately uh, criticized, but some of them work pretty well. And I would assert that they're the better, the best except, or the worst except for all the rest, and sometimes they really work. Um, I s just recently rotated off a professional education committee for the American Heart Association, and I have some data from them they have a professional education um, center. And for the fourth quarter of 2011, 50,000 doctors went to that site. Half of them cardiologists, another bunch of neurologists for stroke, family practitioners, and emergency doctors. So they're doing something right, and they have access to, to doctors. So I think we really have to think hard about professional associations in in trying to support physician education. Also, timing for professional associations is really important. If they put something together for education of physicians and it's too early, they irritate their physicians and nothing happens. If they put it up too late, you've got an access problem because you've got something that works that doctors aren't using. And so they really try hard to uh, time that just right. And I, I actually pitched the the notion of education in genomics with uh, this group, and that was their one concern. They didn't want to get into the game too early, but they also didn't want to get in too late. So anyway, uh, that one I think is very important in terms of uh, interacting with these uh, professional folks. Um, I'm not going to touch on training of students, residents, or fellows today. That's <coughs> um, You know more about that than I do, certainly, and I, I, I think our, our speaker who didn't make it today was going to talk about that and probably knows a lot about it. I hope when we finish that we'll have good discussion about opportunities because I think we have to start this now because of what Eric said yesterday, this thing is really beginning to move and move very rapidly. 
So uh, just a few uh, comments on the opportunity, and you all know this stuff, there are rapid advances in your science, astonishing reductions in cost and turnaround time, and increased public interest, and I think as Pearl said, expectations are high, and I think they're probably way too high. This is a long-term slog for us, I think, and patients aren't going to see this immediately. Seems like pharmacogenomics is approaching the clinical horizon. We've got good work going on in clinical decision support, and medical leadership is, is very good, particularly at your centers. Um, I think there's a genuine interest and apprehension in practicing doctors. And I'll tell you an anecdote. Uh, we put together with uh, NHGRI a lecture series at Suburban Hospital for clinicians. And at the start, uh, the, the initial lecture in that, David Valley gave a wonderful talk, and the clinician sitting next to me at the end of it looked at me and said, I don't understand anything. What's a SNP? <laughs> Anybody else wants to hire me? <laughs> Get that recommendation on your LinkedIn site. There. <laughs> I think it had to do with the reception rather than the delivery, <laughs> David. Um, I guess the other thing you're all aware of is a successful and really informative New, New England Journal of Medicine series on genomics. Uh, those who read it probably know more than this clinician, but uh, in fairness to clinicians, they knock it out hard every day, and they're not reading everything in the medical literature, that's for sure. And yet they're the folks that are passing out this care to people that matter. The barriers, um, largely innocent of genetics and genomics. Um, multiple categories of physicians with different interests and needs. I think we really need to keep that in mind. And genomics transcends specialty areas, so it stretches across a whole different bunch of folks, some who are really interested in this and sophisticated, others who aren't, and it seems to me it's really important that we keep that in mind. Um, as I mentioned, professional associations worried about, worry about getting ahead of their members, and this can cause an executive director his uh, job if he's not too careful about that. We've got lots of people interested in education, no means to fund it, and it's difficult to monitor advances over so broad a piece of science, and it seems to me that's a really big problem and one that we have to deal with. A minute on physician statistics. There are 850,000 physicians licensed to practice in this country. 624,000 of them do mostly clinical care. And of those, 209,000 are really primary care physicians. That is, they, they deal with uh, the general run of what run wanders into a doctor's office. I also wanted to mention there's an estimated shortage coming up in the next 15 years, uh, 150,000 by some experts, so we've got a real problem there as well. The other piece about the general practitioners is you all know that they slug it out in the office every day, and it's really tough. Every 15 minutes, a patient with three systems down, that's really, that's really very difficult. So a few uh, thoughts on the way forward. I guess we could do nothing and let the traditional means of education sort of do their bit. It seems to me that's not very satisfying, and I think it's really irresponsible. I think the first thing is, I think this has already been set in place, is to set up a process for review and consensus development. What matters, what doesn't, how big a deal is it, how accurate is it. Um, and it seems to me that we ought to try for genomics literacy across the whole spectrum of practicing physicians. They ought to know what a SNP is, and they ought to have some sense of what's important, what's not important. They don't need to get into all the details, but they really ought to have a sense of what's important in this field. Seems like pharmacogenomics is going to be pretty close to what most physicians deal with, since all of them use drugs. And I, I mentioned to some of you, it seems to me that doctors who are in practice respond to cases. That's where they live, and so I wondered whether it would be useful for us to collect a vignette, a series of vignettes about where genomics matters today in patients, and I think you all probably have some uh, examples of that, and I would hope we could collect that and use it. I think we also have to rank order physician uh, specialties and associations by the proximity of the science to the clinical horizon 
and the likely number of patients involved. That is, we ought to really focus on those where we have something really good to sell and that it involves a lot of people. Uh, I think you have to, we have to um, interact with these professional so societies such that when, um, when a clinical science matures, that guidelines are prepared and delivered just in time. I think physicians are not ready to accept that this is going to be important someday. They need to have something that's important tomorrow. I think public, edu <coughs> public education has to go on uh, in parallel because patients and doctors have to see the same things. And I thought that New England Journal series was very good. I put this up just to sort of show you at least a partial list of these associations and the number of members they have. And they range from uh, the biggest, which is the College of Physicians, a very important part, the, the Academy of Pediatrics, and then smaller associations. And I'm sure I've left one out. I think I did leave out the Infectious Disease Society of America. But these are the folks that I think we're going to have to strike out and and form some sort of communication relationship with now so that when we're in the point at the point where we really need to deliver some of this stuff we've we've got the relationship and I threw in uh, these societies which are big and not necessarily uh, 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 physician societies alone they're very large organizations which have uh, um, a, a different collection of uh, practicing physicians, and I think they're all really important. So that concludes what I had to say. I, I was hoping that we would get discussion from this, and I'll be happy to answer your questions or listen to your comments. Good. So comments? I, OK. David, Howard. Can you go back one side? Uh, yeah, so you don't have uh, American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, which recently renamed itself to reflect its interest in playing a major role in translating all of this into uh, medicine. Um, and it's tiny, and the experience of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics is the number of physicians entering our specialty is declining. But the number of master's degree genetic counselors is increasing nicely, although can't possibly meet the need. And the number of PhD laboratory trained people is increasing. So the laboratory component, the genetic counseling component are growing but need to grow faster. The physician component is declining in the face of increased needs. So I think all of these education discussions need to be much broader uh, in terms of physicians, PhDs, nurses, PAs, PharmDs, all the groups that need more genomic medicine education in order to address these needs, because it's just not going to come from current physician workforce. Thank you. I, I didn't include them. I know they're there, and I know they're very, very well aware of what's going on here. Other comments? OK, so, so Howard, I think, was next. So I'm, I'm wondering, in the context of, of physician education, I'm, I'm wondering whether we're, we're trying too hard. Uh, because the, the radiology community didn't try to make generalists into biophysicists. And we don't need to make generalists into molecular biologists or geneticists, okay. even. Okay. Uh, and so certainly knowing what a SNP is would be useful. Um, but but there, there are a lot of elements that can remain in the black box, and they're just fine with that. Excellent. It's more the, the, the usage part of it that's important. You know, most, most generalists don't care how bilirubin is measured. They want to use it. Um, so there are nuances that we get really uh, jumpy about. I mean, but at the end of the day, I think if we m maybe calibrated the need a little bit better, uh, we, we might have more inroads, especially with the initial stuff. Now, ACMG needs something different from the American Co Academy of Pediatrics but, or, or some of these others. But, uh, you know, I, I think in some ways maybe we need to lower our, our goals to, um, to something more achievable. I think that's a good point. It does seem to me that, that that's a part of the point that all physicians aren't created equal in this. I mean, podiatrists are probably not much interested in it. But internists who deal with uh, 
subspecialties of the medicine, I think, are very interested in it, and they really ought to know the pharmacogenomics pretty well, it seems to me. But I take your point. Other comments? There's a long speaker's list. I'm watching it. Don't worry. Okay. A couple of quick comments. First, having done this kind of education for about 15 years, recently the American College of Physicians has reached out to the American Society of Human Genetics, the American College of Medical Genetics, and a couple of other groups, and said they're interested. And that's the first thing I found that's really, really helpful. It's now on their radar. And John Tucker, who is their former executive director, is actually charged with that. So I think there's a huge opportunity there for us to reach out to them. The second, you probably noticed or you may not have in Joanne Armstrong's presentation yesterday that Aetna has a focus on genetics education and actually has a budget for it. And I think we really need to figure out how to partner with them because they can actually require the physicians in their system to do some Aetna education every year. Um, and I believe they reach one in 10 U.S. physicians. So huge um, thing. And then my last comment is that there was a very successful program that the American College of Medical Genetics did a uh, probably 10 years ago with endocrinology. And what they did is they switched the paradigm a little bit in that they made the endocrinologist a patient and took them through genetic testing. So they really saw the power of genetic testing and the effect that it could have on them and then took that back. Um, and a lot of endocrinologists started using genetic testing who hadn't before. So that's a model I think we could replicate in many professions. Yeah, we could all have 23 and me done on ourselves. Well, they, yeah, but I mean, when they really, what, what we did is at their meeting, we set up where they had had pre-testing and then they had short genetic counseling sessions and it was just eye-opening. I, I was one of the counselors there and talked to like 10 of these endocrinologists and they didn't know what a genetic test was. They didn't, but it really became powerful when you made it something that would apply to them and their family and then use that in relation to their patients. Just curious, what, what genetic testing did they have done? Like yeah. just a couple candidate genes? Or um, I, MEN2 and some other um, things that have an endocrinology well, basis. So we had a whole workbook. We picked like six conditions and... Um, did any of them have anything? Um, <laughs> Actually, yes. Oh, but okay. <laughs> so it, Say it, no it, more. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Physician client privileges. But, um, but I do think that's a powerful, and you can even do it in an abstract where you set up the whole process, um, but I think that would be something that would be really worth um, thinking about doing with some of these other groups because they just don't put genetics on their radar, and this got it on their radar. Michael, Josh, Pearl, Jeff. I can't, everybody wants to say something. So, Michael? Wait, I, I okay. have to say something. <laughs> so, I just spoke I just, at the American. See a hand down there. I know, I, don't know, I know. I just took over to the mic. Right. So, um, <laughs> I just spoke at the American College of Physicians. They invited us back for a second year. Um, it was actually an ethics session, but all on gen genetics, genomics. And I'm invited to speak at the American Geriatric Society later this fall, and I still haven't figured out what they want me to say. but. <sighs> Um, so I think we do. I bet there are lots of people in the room who get those types of invitations, and there are, there is interest out there. Okay, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> oh, and also I just have to say, <laughs> <laughs> in response to Dr. Ledbetter, the I was just on the American Board of Medical Genetics, and actually the numbers of clinical geneticists and so forth is is kind of leveled out. We're no longer declining in our numbers of enrollees into programs, so that's good news for us. I was I was going to say that the. The drivers of physician education are um, CME credits, uh, board certification or um, maintenance examination uh, con content, and patient questions in the uh, in the room. So, so until those three things happen, you're going to find a lot of physicians not interested. Um, and the other comment would be that. Um, the new way to uh, deliver physician education is in short. 10 to 20 minute uh, interactive web-based uh, CME credits. So, uh, so people that are thinking about education and getting out to groups of practitioners, no matter doctors or others, uh, that's one thing to really think about in your design. And those uh, are really good ones for cases, like mm -hmm. short cases. Right. So go to that other point. Okay. Uh, Murray, then Josh. Um, Pearl, at, at the Marshfield yeah. Clinic, we've, we've done just exactly that. So we have uh, now uh, mandatory computer-based training um, in pain management that includes a module on pharmacogenetics, and uh, it's, it's really quite nice. And so our physicians, all of them now, um, know about, you know, um, CYP2D6 and, and variants of that. So it's, it's, it's really nice. It, it's worked quite well. 
Um, I, I'm not sure if it's proprietary. I don't think it is, but I, 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 could, I could ask. Sounds like a nice model. Yeah, is there, is there a way to do that in your research? Because it's by the okay. facility, so it's kind of glossy. Okay, great. So, so, okay. so um, I was just going to say, that <laughs> should we all raise our hands again? The, um, uh, uh, so I think this is a real demonstration of um, a case where, you know, there's going to be, you know, there's a fire hydrant, it's just going to get worse. And uh, it's one of those real opportunities as, as, as uh, a representative of the informatics community for, I think, us to engage as meaningful use comes on board, more and more EMRs are out there, that, that um, we can deliver that information just in time. And if you could, um, and, and this is what we're trying to do with some of our prospective genotyping efforts. And, and trying to, you know, uh, test some of that in front of physicians, what kind of language looks good and, and how do they respond um, with progressive enabling them to kind of click and learn more just kind of as they need it. But uh, we're never going to be able to support and educate around everything. If we can support and educate around the concepts they need, then maybe <coughs> we can do more and more just-in-time stuff with informatics. I, I wouldn't sell specialists and some specialists short some of them are very smart and very able, and um, if you put it in front of them and it seems like it's useful, they'll lick it up. That's no, I don't think there's any question about and, that. And, and in fact, we actually have a link off of our uh, uh, advisor rounds to 2C19 where they can see you know, all 60 articles that we've curated around uh, Clopidogrel if they want to read it. That's great. Um, I know you knowledge, knowledge map for, for genome education. I know that um, resident or medical school and resident education wasn't part of your talk, but is there any evidence that the younger doctors are trained up adequately? And you know, <laughs> well, I know not a chance. I mean, I, I mean, it, it's a yeah. You, know, you look at the curriculum, and it is a little scary. Um, and on one side, I mean, there's a lot of concern that they're not being taught physical exams. Um, and my one, like, what are they being taught instead? Um, and I know just anecdotally, just going onto the wards and seeing a person with shock, and I you know, thought, oh, I know how to deal with this, you know, volume, 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 and pressors. And immediately went off into what calcium channel blocker might be a mutation. And meanwhile, you know, the patient's dying of hypotension. So my concern is, I mean, is there any data that the, the new wave can potentially educate the are geezers, or is everybody in the same bad boat? I guess I, I'll take, I'll, I'll say a, a piece here. I, I, I do think we run the risk of having a sort of a, a, an intergenerational tussle here, but my goodness, um, surgery is really suffering today, and the reason is that they're limited to 80 hours in the hospital. And I've seen residents in their second year who I'm told don't know how to tie knots. And so what happens to those residents is they go out and make the mistakes while they're in practice that they should have made while they're in, in a more controlled setting. Anybody else know about what's going on in medical schools? So uh, a couple comments. Uh, first of all, the online tools are great, but uh, just a word of caution that our place, uh, there's a current uh, calculation of the total hours required to be spent on online exams of various things, responsible conduct of research, HIPAA, blah, 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 and it was estimated to take about one week of eight hours a day to complete the on current online uh, requirements. So adding more may not be um, received favorably. Uh, that's not to say there's not still not a niche to fill. That we've changed our curriculum. We're trying to infuse a medical, a genetic thinking into the education of medical students. Um, it, it's too early to, uh, for us to know whether or not we've achieved any kind of success. Um, and the, if you think about changing the curriculum as an experiment, it's a very hard thing to gauge the success of an experiment because you, the controls are very difficult to come by. Um, so it may be in the category of an experiment that you just get all the uh, opinions in one room and try to make your best choice and, and go for it that way. The other thing I'll say, though, is it's clear that medical education has different challenges at different phases of the career. So you have the medical students, then you have the house staff, and the house staff 
do a lot of educating of the medical students in the third and fourth years. If you don't educate the house officers, anything you do to the medical students is likely to get beaten out of them in years three and four. Um, and then, uh, then you have to educate the practicing physicians and your academic colleagues. So I think it may be uh, important to think about different strategies for different levels of medical education. And in a way, I think they have to be taken on almost simultaneously uh, so that you, bec because the educational experience goes on for such a long period of time. Thank you, David. It seems to me that um, this machine is going to deliver wonderful results, and we don't know exactly where. And um, we're going to be in tough shape if we're not ready to deal with them. Uh, two quick comments. Um, one uh, relative to Andy's uh, anecdote about the endocrinologist, Suzanne Haga, who could not be here today, has published a paper that um, has shown after surveying uh, hundreds of primary care physicians uh, that um, those that actually had genetic testing on themselves were ten times more likely to order a genetic test for their patients. So that's a provocative piece of data that could be channeled constructively into some educational programs. We could offer it to our medical students. It's being done. Yeah, at, so, at the other, so. Okay, I have a second comment. Do you want to? You make your, so I, well, so let me, <laughs> so for the second year this year, uh, we uh, engaged in an exercise at Vanderbilt stolen from the Stanford experience, so I, I make no apologies for that. We managed to get it into the curriculum. They managed to get it as a summer optional course where we offer, uh, we offer 23andMe testing to the medical school class. And we go through a, a long sort of pre-test uh, exercise where we discuss the ethical downsides and you know what an odds ratio of 1.2 actually means. And then they go and pick up their kits and spit I, I, I don't think anyone's had their dog spit yet, <laughs> but you know who knows who, who and, 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 and then we have a, a, a session where we deliver the results to them and Josh actually organizes a, a, a survey that they fill out and the f survey is sort of, you know, what was your odds ratio for developing type 2 diabetes? What was your odds ratio for this and that? And then a whole session on ancestry and a whole session on rare things that 23andMe looks at. And, and the, you know, would you do this again? Do you feel like you're smarter? Those kinds of things. But I, I think it comes back to the, to the point that you made, that, that w when you do this on yourself and you get the results, it's sort of, oh, isn't that, th there is sort of a resonance of some kind that, that I think Suzanne would have told us about and, and you know, I certainly felt when I looked at my own website. So I, I think that's a tool. And one of the things that I hope I'll be able to do is, is interrogate the medical students who had it last year and who are now coming into fourth year and say, well, you know, do you remember that session at all? Uh, do you remember anything about it? Does it make you think differently about a patient when you're sitting on the ward? So those are the kinds of things that I'd like to hear. And Josh participates when he's not traveling, which is not a criticism because I travel more, um, uh, in, in delivering that kind of information yeah. to the medical students. It seems like so. that might also populate our ranks with people who want to do this. So I like the idea of, of sort of, you know, personalizing it somehow so they remember and they know how it feels, whether it's that way or your way or our way. I don't, I don't know what the right way is. Probably any one of those experiences are right. So your other oh comment. Yeah. My other comment is that I think this guidelines topic, with all the caveats that uh, Paul raised this morning, needs to be an agenda item for our next meeting when we engage these professional organizations because my, my bias is that it's the, it's the equivalent of having primary care physicians review a genetics grant. I mean, how are, just, in it was, it came up in the EGAP discussion yesterday about pharmacogenetics. I mean, the people that are making the guidelines are probably not in this room, it would be my guess, except for the CPIC group, which is sort of an interesting way to approach it. And maybe we should even think about how CPIC could be a resource for the professional organizations instead of having them reinvent the wheel. I'm sure that most of them realize that they need help and um, we might be able to give it to them. Okay, there are lots of hands still. Um, <coughs> behind you. So, oh, okay. oh, oh, sorry, so, uh, the Air Force goes first. This Air Force goes first. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then sorry. It's just no, Cecilia. I, I just had a quick comment about um, the National Coalition for Health Professional Education and Genetics. Um, they were kind enough to work with us on our symposium last September. And um, in terms of our enrollment strategy for our study, 
uh, I made the decision to enroll people who are part of the healthcare team because although as physicians in theory we're the leader of that team, I wanted to try to start that genomic literacy effort for all of our providers. So in our system that's nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurses of course, and then our medical technicians as well because they do have increasingly independent roles in terms of the way that they interact with patients. Thanks. And pharmacists, very important. Sorry, if I could just throw one thing in here real quickly. So I surveyed. Okay, oh. go ahead. So, so in a lateral life, I created an educational uh, management system. And, um, and so I created, I pulled up 400 concepts uh, related to genetics and survey 10 years of our curriculum. And um, it uh, actually has increased. Um, 22 lectures, um, hour, about hours of the curriculum in 2002, and um, 147 in 2010. Wow, thank you. Welcome to, the in welcome to an informatics rich world. Right, and on the informatics note, so clinical informatics was approved as a board certified subspeciality last September. The first exams will be in 2013. So a few places are designing fellowships and rotations for the residents. And so this is your chance to make sure that those rotations and fellowships include exposure to genomics, not just to Microsoft Excel and uh, SQL databases. <laughs> So the clinical genomics is a subspecialty in? Clinical informatics. Oh, in pathology. In clinical informatics. In pathology. In pathology. In pathology. In pathology. And so in there's also a biomedical informatics subspecialty in preventive medicine. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Okay. OK, other comments? I saw lots of hands, but they all just disappeared. OK, yes. So two things. One is that um, one of the other ways to go about this is actually to get the fellows as specialists to take a little bit more interest in genetics. So ACMG has worked on, instead of going through a genetics fellow residency or fellowship, is actually have like a one-year course of, so somebody's a cardiologist and wants to specifically look at cardiovascular genetics, have a program like that. And so you don't need to train everybody to be a general geneticist, you just need to train them in a specialty that's applicable to them and then hopefully they'll be the leaders as, go, as going out. The other thing that doing, uh, student education, one of the things that I've started to do is how to teach the students how to look at uncertainty. And so these variants of unknown significance, you know, these are common. We get them all the time. But how do you, you get the students to think about how to critically analyze information? And this is apple to the regular life, too. I mean, you get a lab result and you're like, well, what am I supposed to do with this, you know, potassium? Do I watch it? Do I repeat it? Do I treat it right away? But this is a, this is a good lifelong lesson that if you can treat teach them how to look at uncertainty, how to evaluate it, and how to react to it, that it's not just helpful to genetics or genomics, but to everything else as well. David, one more. Okay. Just to put in a plug, uh, this summer will be the 53rd annual short course in experimental and medical genetics at the Jackson Labs in Bar Harbor. It's a two-week course, 53 lectures, and uh, eight workshops, uh, lots of prominent speakers. It's really pegged at just the right level for fellows, uh, PhD students, uh, and young assistant, uh, young faculty who are in various specialties but want to sort of get a two-week intensive experience in genetics. I highly recommend it. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, I think we'll, we'll stop this part of the discussion. The next, the next discussion is from me, and so you're going to have to Bear with me while I transfer the slides that I've been working on all morning uh, onto, onto a stick. I have to remember where I put them first. No, I while well, yes. you're doing that? Yes, please do, so I mean, do something to take okay. up the dead in air. In terms of um, a, a sort of an alternate thing, we, we're constantly looking from the IRB world in terms of how do you present you know, probability, et cetera. And looking at recent literature on um, how numeracy in the U.S., uh, it was something like 50 percent of the public cannot uh, uh, tell you if uh, 10 out of 1,000 is 1 percent or 10 percent. And then they went to medical students, and they were not much better. So I think where we're talking about even beginning to, you know, talk about relative versus absolute risk, we're talking just percentages. I mean, it's, so it's really scary that, uh, <laughs> again, to end on a positive note here. Yes. <laughs> Someone's got it. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. <laughs>
The, the, answer, the answer is for Eric to fix K through 12 education. Uh, and, uh, we already, we, we established that yesterday. So, so rather than watch Dan yeah. struggle his way through this, just a, just a quick question for folks. Um, we, we will be talking about locations for meetings and that, but, but any, any thoughts about this particular hotel? Is this a, a positive? If we come to Chicago, would you rather be here even though it tends to be a bit more expensive? Um, or, you know, we can go to a, a, an outlying hotel, but you have to take a shuttle to get to it and that. Any strong feelings? The prices are good. good. Yeah. Okay. So, so no strong feelings? Yes. The O'Hare Hilton is my favorite place in the whole world for a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are. It's my least favorite. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the St. Croix home is pretty nice, too. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Mary.